Hey students, we are in module five. Um, module five deals with Joel, Zechariah, Malachi, or sorry, Joel, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, and Obadiah. So uh, I am not going to hit all of those in this mini lecture. I am just going to drill down on Zechariah. Zechariah is the longest of the minor prophets. And it's, uh, it's something that uh, I've spent a lot of time on. Uh, dissertation was on this subject. And so it's, it's near and dear to my heart. That's why I'm going to hit it today. So uh, we're starting with Dr. Hearson's notes, and I'm going to add some things to that in, in what I say today. <clears throat> So, uh, it is the most frequently quoted of the minor prophets in the New Testament. There are 71 quotations. A third of these appear in the Gospels. 31 of these are found in Revelation. So, the other 40 are not. Uh, it is second only to the book of Ezekiel in terms of influence on the book of Revelation. And those are... That, that kind of imagery is evident when you read the book of, Isaac, of Zechariah. Sorry. So the author of the book, uh, Zechariah, means Yahweh remembers. Um, the author is the son of Berechiah, son of Edo, the prophet. He started, uh, this is Zechariah, started his ministry in around 520 BC in the same year that Haggai prophesied. So he's a contemporary there. Um, we. We generally think of, uh, and I mean uh, evangelical conservative scholars, generally think of uh, chapters 1 through 8 as composed early in his ministry, and then 9 through 14 probably later in his ministry. Um, Hearson talks about how 1 through 8 were probably written when, he, when Zechariah was 30 or so, and then 9 through 14 when he was older, about 70 or so. So the later chapters would have come at a time when the Persian Empire was on its way down, perhaps after the death of Darius and the revolt of Egypt. So there are a lot of things at play politically in this book um, because of the rise and fall of Persia during this time. Um, and so because of that, the content looks very different in the two sections here. So let's talk about the unity of the book. Um, the first thing I want to mention that I did not see in Dr. Hearson's notes is that the, the book of Zechariah and then M Malachi um, contain a unique uh, word which is sometimes taken as marking divisions uh, in um, a book, uh, the word masa. Uh, you see that appear at the beginning of chapter nine, um, which seems to break this into units. Uh, the way it appears also in Malachi makes people sometimes think that um, these are three distinct compositions. So then that would mean that Zechariah 9 through 14 are not actually written by the same author as 1 through 8. That's not my position, but that is, um, that is one that you will encounter. Uh, it, it even gets more nuanced than that. Um, so another position which Hearson doesn't necessarily talk about is that there was a, a later deuteronomistic editor who created these these sources um or created zechariah using this deuteronomistic tradition uh that they also shaped the pentateuch and the uh, the prophecies of several prophets including zechariah to bring the language into kind of agreement between them i take a different position um, i would argue that based on the language in zechariah when you compare it to um, the language in Deuteronomy in uh, Exodus, where where God, uh, where the author is making allusions to previous texts, I, I would say based on textual examination, that Zechariah is expanding on and applying those earlier texts, which seems to show, you know, by logical inference, that it would be dependent upon 
what was already written in the Pentateuch uh, or the Torah. And so uh, I would take a different position that uh, this was written earlier, the conservative position here, you know, 500 ish BC. So um, that is part of what's going on here. So um, the big issue, obviously, is the division between 9 through 14 and uh, 1 through 8. Um, it's based largely on the idea of content and style, uh, as we've talked about earlier. It's less of an issue if you think of this occurring later on in his life when political circumstances have changed. And so you would expect uh, different imagery and, and style to happen when describing different types of things and different um, political circumstances, if you will. So 9 through 14 is focused much more on the end than 1 through 8. Uh, that has kind of driven this position of two compositions as well. Again, that's not my position, but that's one that you will see. Uh, Hearson talks about how, uh, how he particularly wants to counter these arguments. Uh, he would say, since there's no agreement on the identity of the shepherds in chapter 11, um, then, then that is a, a mark against this late composition of 9 through 14. Basically, uh, people tend to identify these shepherds um, as something that happened in the Maccabean period or even the Greek period later on. Uh, and so that would be an argument that uh, since they can't agree on these, then it's probably unlikely that this was written that late, is what he's arguing. So uh, then the second point would be that Zechariah did write both, but in periods of his life that were very far apart. And this would make sense uh, about style and content. This is something I've already mentioned. Uh, so there are differences in style, obviously, but there's also similarities. Uh, and generally, when people want to make this style and content argument, they focus on the differences rather than uh, taking the similarities and differences into view. Uh, there was a computational study done by Ray Day on Isaiah, which kind of found the same thing, that there's probably more co correspondences than differences between Isaiah's first and second half. Uh, similar things in Zechariah. Um, I'm not aware of that computational study being done, but that people have kind of agreed that's, that's likely the case, that, that it's more similar than different. So um, what I consider to be a large um, weighty argument in favor of single authorship is that we see no manuscript evidence for two sections being separate. Uh, we don't see uh, copies of Zechariah only containing one through eight. Uh, we also don't see um, manuscript evidence where there is a, a break that would signify these two being separate but kind of stuck together. Um, the theory for different authorship was not put forward until thousands of years after uh, they were accepted as authoritative writings. So um, that in and of itself kind of, I, I don't know that that necessarily is a strong argument, but it's certainly an argument that it wasn't until thousands of years later that people started thinking, well, are these different or is something going on here? Um, so the historical distance is, is kind of a problem. Um, <clears throat> so let's say we're going to talk about a couple of, of things here. There are eight night visions. That's the main part of, of one through eight. And you can read what those are in, uh, in the notes there. Um, it kind of concludes with this uh, crowning of Joshua the high priest, and it's to symbolize that God's servant, the branch, would build the temple and rule as a priest on the throne and bring peace between the offices of king and priest. Probably a messianic implication there, right? Um, so we're going to move forward to uh, chapters 9 through 14. Um, Nine, uh, 9 through 17 talks about Israel's king riding on a donkey, which is not atypical for royalty in the Semitic world. 
uh, this would symbolize that the, the king would bring everlasting peace. His dominion would be over the whole earth. So Jesus partially fulfilled this in Matthew 21 when he rides in on a donkey. Uh, many rejoiced at that time. You can, you can get in your mind now why the people were so expectant of Jesus becoming the king and, uh, and fulfilling this prophecy uh, that he would overthrow Rome and bring the rule of Israel to the whole earth because they're looking at this prophecy here. Well, we know later on uh, that will happen, but that's not the moment in salvation history that occurred at that point. Um, so then when we talk about uh, the next section, 10.2 through 11.7, uh, we talk about, uh, we see a motif of shepherds. Uh, they're worthless. They're, they don't care for their flocks. And so God commands Zechariah to assume the command, but the people reject him. Uh, it seems to indicate that another bad leader would precede God's ultimate leader. That's a theme that Revelation picks up on. Um, I want to kind of end on uh, the fifth point here on page five, which is that Zechariah and, and a lot of these prophets, they don't distinguish between the first and second coming of the Messiah. For Zechariah, the Messiah's coming uh, represents this one glorious future event. Uh, we can look back with joy on the forgiveness of sin accomplished by Jesus' first coming and look forward with hope toward the second coming and the fulfillment of all of these eschatological uh, hopes that the minor prophets, including Zechariah, give us.